Mormonism Unveiled, or The Life and Confessions of the Late Mormon Bishop, John D. Lee, written by himself. Produced and recorded and read by Paul Martin, copyright 2019, Paul Martin's Fine Films and Audiobooks. Embracing a history of Mormonism from its inception down to the present time, with an exposition of the secret history, signs, symbols and crimes of the Mormon Church. Also the true history of the horrible butchery known as the Mountain Meadows Massacre. St. Louis, Brian Brand and Company, New York, W. H. Stells and Company, 1877. Publishers Preface John D. Lee's prominent connection with the Mormon Church and the almost universal desire on the part of the public to know the secrets that he could tell gave a peculiar interest to the life and doings of this man and led to a general inquiry for his autobiography and confessions. This has caused the publication of several pretended lives and confessions of John D. Lee, the materials for which were collected from fragmentary newspaper reports and advertised by certain unscrupulous publishers as genuine. We therefore deem it but simple justice to those who may read this book to state how we obtained the true and only life and confessions of John D. Lee. It was stated at the time of Lee's execution that he had left the manuscripts of his life and confessions with his confidential attorney for publication. We at once wrote to Colonel William Nelson, U.S. Marshal of Utah Territory, requesting him to give us the address of Lee's attorney. He replied promptly, stating that Mr. W. W. Bishop of Pioshi, Nevada, was the man. We immediately entered into correspondence with Mr. Bishop and made a contract with him for the publication of the work. In proof of the fact that this is the genuine and only Life and Confessions of John D. Lee, we refer to Colonel William Nelson, U.S. Marshal, Utah Territory, Honorable uh, Stokes, Deputy U.S. Marshal, Honorable Sumner Howard, U.S. Attorney, the Editor of the Salt Lake Tribune, Colonel G.O.M. Sabin, Pioche, Nevada, Mr. William W. Bishop of the same place, and to John D. Lee's letter to Mr. Bishop on page 84 of this book. Lee wrote his life and confessions in prison after his sentence to death and subsequent to his execution, his manuscripts were copied and prepared for publication by Mr. Bishop. They were at no time out of his possession or from under his immediate control until they were delivered to the express company on the 17th day of May, 1877, to be forwarded to us. The Mormon leaders were so greatly alarmed at the prospect of the publication of Lee's writings and the consequent revelation of their secrets and crimes that they sent their blood atoners to threaten the life of Mr. Bishop and, if possible, compel him to give up the manuscripts. The danger was so great that he was compelled to have his office guarded while engaged in copying the papers, and when they were ready to be forwarded to the publishers, the Wells, Fargo and Company express refused to receive them until they were furnished with an armed guard to protect them until 
they were beyond the reach of the Mormons. The fears of the Mormon dignitaries were well founded, for these revelations of crimes committed by them are of the most startling character. The Publishers Mormonism Unveiled The Life and Confessions of the Late Mormon Bishop John D. Lee Read by Paul Martin Preface I was requested by John Doyle Lee after he had been sentenced to be shot for the part he took in the commission of the Mountain Meadows Massacre to publish an account of his life and confessions in order to inform the world how it was that he had acted as he had and why he was made a scapegoat by the Mormon Church. I accepted the trust and in giving publicity to the facts now for the first time fully brought to light, I am only performing what I believe to be a duty to him and to the public. The Mountain Meadows Massacre stands without a parallel amongst the crimes that stain the pages of American history. It was a crime committed without cause or justification of any kind to relieve it of its fearful character. Over 120 men, women and children were surrounded by Indians and more cruel whites and kept under constant fire from hundreds of unerring rifles for five days and nights during all of which time the emigrants were famished for water. When nearly exhausted from fatigue and thirst, they were approached by white men with a flag of truce and induced to surrender their arms under the most solemn promises of protection. They were then murdered in cold blood and left nude and mangled upon the plain. All this was done by a band of fanatics who had no cause of complaint against the emigrants, except that the authorities of the Mormon church had decided that all the emigrants who were old enough to talk should die. Revenge for insults to Brigham Young. And the booty of the plundered train being the inciting causes of the massacre. John D. Lee was one and only one of 58 Mormons who there carried out the orders of the Mormon priesthood. He has died for his crimes. Shall the others escape? The entire history of this atrocious crime is given in the confession, how it was done and why it was the wish of the Mormons that it should be done. All is fully stated. As one of the attorneys for John D. Lee, I did all that I could to save his life. My associates were and are able men and fine lawyers, but fact and fate united to turn the verdict against us. The history of the first and second trials is familiar to most of the American people. Therefore, I will not describe them here any more than to say, Mormonism prevented conviction at the first trial, and at the second trial, Mormonism ensured conviction. After Brigham Young and his worshippers had deserted Lee and marked him as the victim that should suffer to save the church from destruction on account of the crimes it had ordered, after all chances of escape had vanished and death was certain as the result of the lifelong service he had rendered the church, the better nature of Lee overcame his superstition and fanaticism, and he gave to me the history of his life and his confession of the facts connected with the massacre, and wished me to have the same published. 
why he refused to confess at an earlier day and save his own life by placing the guilt where it of right belonged is a question which is answered by the statement that he is still a slave to his endowment and Danite oaths and trusted until too late to the promises of protection made to him by Brigham Young. John D. Lee was a fanatic, and as such, believed in the Mormon Church, and aided in carrying out the orders of that church. I believe it is my duty to publish this work, to show mankind the fruits resulting from obedience to Mormon leaders and to show that Mormonism was as certainly the cause of the Mountain Meadows Massacre as it is that fanaticism has been the mother of crime in all ages of the world. I also wish the American people to read the facts as they are told by a mistaken and fanatical follower of the Mormon doctrines yet one who was a brave man, and according to his ideas and teaching a good man, who did not wish, who who did not believe he was doing wrong when obeying the commands of the Mormon priesthood. I wish the American people to read this work, and then say, if they can, what should be the fate of those who caused the crime to be committed. The following pages contain simply true copies of material furnished me by John D. Lee for the purpose of being published, all of which was written by him while in prison and after the jury had returned its verdict of guilty. I have no excuses to offer for publishing the work just as it is. It is what it purports to be, a full history of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and also a sketch of the life of John D. Lee, embracing a revelation of the secret history of Mormonism, from its inception down to the death of Lee, with a correct copy of him, confession as given to me for publication. If any feel injured by the facts... I cannot help it. If this publication shall in any degree aid in securing the much-needed legislation demanded by the American citizens of Utah from the national government so that church criminals as well as Gentiles can be convicted in Utah, I shall feel that I have been paid well toy all the vexations I have endured in the land of the saints, where they murder men, women and children for the glory of God and the upbuilding of his kingdom. I also believe this publication will be an advantage to the large number of naturally good and honest people who inhabit Utah who joined the church and moved to Utah believing it their Christian duty to do so. To that class of people, I am indebted for many favours, and with them, future prosperity. W. W. Bishop, Confidential Attorney of John D. Lee, Pioche, Nevada, May 17th, 1877. End of the preface. Mormonism Unveiled by John D. Lee Read by Paul Martin Introductory 120 men, women and children were murdered by Mormons and Indians at the Mountain Meadows on Friday, September the 16th, 1857 or thereabouts. The victims were members of a train under command of Captain Fancher and are generally known as the Arkansas Emigrant Company. At that time, Brigham Young was governor of Utah Territory and also head of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
Acting as governor of the territory, he and his followers had for a series of years violated the laws of the United States with insulting impunity and then were standing in hostile attitude towards the government. Brigham Young had the audacity to declare Utah under martial law and call out his legions of fanatics to oppose the forces of the United States which had been ordered to Utah to enforce obedience to the government. As leader and head of the Mormon Church, he had taught his followers to believe that he was an inspired man and as such receiving orders and revelations direct from the God of heaven that the time had arrived when Christ was to come to earth and reign a thousand years, and that all who did not accept the Book of Mormon and the teachings of Brigham Young as God's holy religion were to suffer death and the wealth of the unbelievers to become the property of the so-called saints. He had also taught the doctrine that all who opposed his orders or refused obedience to his commands should die and if they had been members of the Mormon church their blood was to be shed in order to save their souls. At that time Brigham Young had the sole control of everything in Utah. His word was law. His orders were given under the pretense that they emanated from God and to disobey his orders was treason to the church and punishable by death. The Mormon people were willing followers of their designate designing leader. They believed in polygamy, blood atonement and the inspiration of the priesthood. Their intelligence made their fanaticism the more dangerous. No crime was so great that it would not be ordered by Brigham Young. If he believed it would benefit Mormonism and no order could be given by him but what his deluded followers considered it their bounden duty to unquestioningly obey. The oaths taken by the Mormons in their various ceremonies bound them under fearful penalties to lay aside all individuality and become the willing tools of a cruel and treasonable priesthood. Blind obedience to Brigham Young was the test of Christian excellence. Salvation and celestial glory were offered by the church leaders and confidently expected by the brethren as the reward to be received for the most fearful crimes. Brigham Young held the keys of heaven, so it was said, and so his followers believed, and certain it was, beheld the life of every man in the territory of Utah in his hand. Law and justice were unheard of, or at least unknown. The so-called Reformation was then at its height. The members of the church were confessing their sins to each other in public and being re-baptised under promise of certain salvation. Superstition, fanaticism and satanic influences of every character had changed the dwellers in Utah from American citizens with reasoning faculties into blind zealots, anxious to do any act that their so-called prophet commanded. It was while this condition of affairs existed in Utah that Captain Fancher attempted to cross the territory on the way to the pleasant valleys of the Golden State, where the company intended to metal and build homes for themselves and their children. In support of the charge that Brigham Young favoured 
the shedding of blood as an atonement for sin, I quote the following compilation of extracts which were kindly furnished me by the Salt Lake Tribune, and as they speak for themselves, comment is useless. Extracts from Brigham Young's Sermon I could refer you to plenty of instances where men have been righteously slain in order to atone for their sins. But now I say, in the name of the Lord, that if this people will sin no more but faithfully live their religion, their sins will be forgiven them without taking life. Now, when you hear my brethren telling about cutting people off from the earth that you consider is strong doctrine, but it is to save them, not to destroy them. All mankind love themselves, and let these principles be known by an individual, and he would be glad to have his blood shed. That would be loving themselves even unto eternal exaltation. This is loving our neighbour as ourselves. If he needs help, help him. If he wishes salvation, and it is necessary to spill his blood upon the ground in order that he be saved, spill it. Any of you who understand the principles of eternity, if you have sinned a sin requiring the shedding of blood, accept the sin unto death would not be satisfied or rest until your blood should be spilled that you might gain the salvation you desire. This is the way to love mankind. It is true the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet ye men can commit sins which it can never remit. As it was in the ancient days, so it is in our day and through the principles are taught publicly from this stand. Still the people do not understand them, yet the law is precisely the same. I have known a great many men who have left this church, for whom there is no chance whatever of exaltation. But if their blood had been spilled, it would have been better for them, The wickedness and ignorance of the nations forbids this principle being in full force. But the time will come when the law of God will be in full force. Will you love your brothers and sisters likewise when they have committed a sin that cannot be atoned for without the shedding of their blood? Will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? That is what Jesus Christ meant. He never told a man or woman to love their enemies in their wickedness. He never intended any such thing. I have known scores and hundreds of people for whom there would have been a chance in the last resurrection of their lives had been taken and their blood spilled upon the ground as a smoking incense to the Almighty, but who are now angels to the devil until our elder brother, Jesus Christ, raises them up, conquers death, hell and the grave. There are sins that can be atoned for by an offering upon an altar, as in ancient days, and there are sins that the blood of a lamb, of a calf or of turtle doves cannot remit, but they must be atoned for by the blood of the man. That is the reason why men talk to you, as they do from this stand. They understand the doctrine, and throw out a few words about it. You have been taught that doctrine, but you do not understand it. Now, take a person in this congregation, who has a knowledge of being saved in the kingdom of our God and our Father, and being an exalted one who knows and understands the principles of eternal life and sees the beauty and excellency of the eternities before him. 
compared with the vain and foolish things of the world and suppose he is overtaken with a gross fault that he has committed a fault which he knows will deprive him of that exaltation which he desires and that he cannot attain to it without the shedding of blood and also knows that by having his blood shed he will atone for that sin and be saved and be exalted with the gods is there a man or woman in this house but would say shed my blood that I may be saved and exalted with the gods <coughs> Brigham Young had also written letters to his chief men throughout the territory inciting them against the people of the United States that it may be understood what kind of language he used to his bishops in these circulars I copy the one sent to William H. Dame the man who was colonel and commander of the militia in southern Utah and who afterwards and while standing upon mountain meadows examining the bodies of those that he had directed hate to slaughter said I will not have given the orders if I had thought there were so many of them the circular bears date two days before the massacre is charged to have been committed and the supposition is that it had been delivered to Dame at the time he issued his orders for the massacre it explains itself and reads as follows Great Salt Lake City September the 14th 1857 Colonel William H. Dame Parowan Iron Company Herewith you will receive the Governor's proclamation declaring martial law You will probably not be called out this fall but are requested to continue to make ready for a big fight another year the plan of operations is supposed to be about this in case the US government should send out an overpowering force we intend to desolate the territory and conceal our family's stock and all of our effects in the fastnesses of the mountains where they will be safe while the men waylay our enemies attack them from ambush stampede their animals take the supply trains cut off detachments and parties sent to cannons for wood or on other surface to lay waste everything that will burn houses fences trees fields grass that they cannot find a particle of anything that will be of use to them not even sticks to make a fire for to cook their suppers to waste away our enemies and lose none that will be our mode of warfare thus you see the necessity of preparing first secure places in the mountains where they cannot find us or if they do where they cannot approach in any force and then prepare for our families building some cabins uh, cacheing flour and grain flour should be ground in the latter part of winter or early in the spring in order to keep so grain in your fields early as possible this fall uh, so that the harvest of another year may come off before they have time to get here conciliate the Indians and make them our fast friends in regard to letting people pass or repass or travel through the territory this applies to all strangers and suspected persons yourself and brother Isaac C. Haight in your district are authorized to give such permits examine all such persons strictly before giving them permits to pass keep things perfectly quiet and let all things be done peacefully but with firmness and let them be no excitement let the people be united in their feelings and faith as well as works 
and keep alive the spirit of the Reformation, and what we said in regard to sowing the grain and provisions, we say again, let there be no waste, save life always when it is possible. We do not wish to shed a drop of blood if it can be avoided. This course will give us great influence abroad. Signed, Brigham Young. Signed, Daniel H. Wells. Next, take the proclamation declaring martial law in the territory and put these facts together. And no fair-minded person can deny that the massacre was the result of the teachings of Brigham Young and that the Mormons in church council decided that the emigrants should be killed as they were afterwards killed. I claim that Brigham Young is the real criminal and that John D. Lee was an instrument in his hands. That Brigham Young used John D. Lee as the assassin uses the dagger to strike down his unsuspecting victim. And as the assassin throws away the dagger to avoid its bloody blade leading to his detection, so Brigham Young used John D. Lee to do his horrid work, and when discovery becomes unavoidable, he hurls Lee from him, cuts him away from the church, and casts him far out into the whirlpool of destruction. The assassin has no further use of his weapon for his weapon. I also claim that if religious fanaticism can clear a man from crime that John D. Lee was guiltless, for he was one of the most intensely fanatical Mormons that infested Utah in 1857. But I do not claim that the fact of his being a fanatic and blinded believer of Brigham Young's so-called revelations excused him far from it. In place of excusing him, it added to his crime. Such insanity as that which religious fanaticism breeds can only and should only be treated by the executioner. And there are many thousands in Utah who are afflicted with the disease that calls for that radical treatment which was administered to Lee. The Mormons around Cedar City especially were insane dreamers. And to them, the Danites, destroying angels and blood atoners, became objects of ecstatic admiration. The Mormons had come into existence to combat the doctrine of Protestants and Catholics alike. They were infatuated followers of designing leaders anxious to earn the martyr's crown by giving up life, if necessary, to advance the interest of the Mormon church, or please one of the priesthood. The Templars and Knights of St. John were no more willing servants of the cross in its war with the Crescent than were the deluded followers of Brigham Young to overthrow all established government and shed the blood of all who were marked as victims by the false prophet who directed their assassin-like actions. They had no law but the will of Brigham Young, no purpose but what they call the will of God. Their discipline was perfect and their devotion absolute. Such was the condition of affairs when the fair plains of Utah were wetted with the blood of over 120 human beings that had been doomed to death by the unanimous voice of the satanic crew that claimed to be servants of the ever-living God. Since that time, every force has been brought forward with Mormonism, which Mormonism could wield to prevent the facts from becoming known. Brigham Young has shielded and rewarded those he well knew were engaged in the unholy work. I cannot explain 
the facts connected with the Mormons and the massacre in any other way so fully and clearly and yet so truly as I can by giving extracts from the speech by Judge Cradlebore, which he delivered in Congress in the year 1863. Judge Cradlebore was an educated, honourable gentleman whose word no man that ever knew him can honestly dispute. He was speaking about the Mountain Meadows Massacre and calling upon Congress the needed legislation for the territory of Utah. The entire speech is one that every lover of our institutions should be familiar with as it most clearly portrays the evils of the Mormon system. I would like to publish the entire speech but will content myself by giving only a part. In regard to what Mormonism is, he says, Mr. Cradlebore, Mr. Speaker, having resided for some time among the Mormons, become acquainted with their ecclesiastical policy, their habits and their crimes, I feel that I would not be discharging my duty if I failed to impart such information as I have acquired in regard to this people in our midst who are building up, consolidating and daringly carrying out a system subversive of the constitution and laws and fatal to morals and true religion. The remoteness of Utah from the settled regions of our country and the absence of any general intercourse between the Mormons and the masses of our people have served to keep the latter in almost complete ignorance of the character and designs of the former. That ignorance, pardonable at first, becomes criminal when the avenues to a full knowledge are open to us. Mormonism is one of the monstrosities of the age in which we live. It seems to have been left for the model republic of the world for the 19th century when the light of knowledge is more generally diffused than ever before, when in art, science and philosophy we have surpassed all that ages of the past can show to produce an idol worthless vagabond of an impostor who heralds forth a creed repulsive to every refined mind, opposed to every generous impulse of the human heart, and a faith which commands a violation of the rights of hospitality, sanctifies falsehood, enforces the systematic degradation of women, not only permits but orders the commission of the vilest lusts in the name of Almighty God himself, and teaches that it is a sacred duty to commit the crimes of theft and murder. It is surprising that such faith taught to in the coarsest and most vulgar way should meet with any success. Yet in less than a century it girdles the globe, Its missionaries are planted in every place. You find them all over Europe, thick through England and Wales, traversing Asia and Africa, braving the billows of the southern oceans to seek proselytes. And and as if to crown in its achievements, it establishes itself in the heart of one of the greatest and most powerful governments of the world, establishes therein a theocratic government overriding all other government, putting the laws at defiance and now seeks to consummate and perpetuate itself by acquiring a state sovereignty and by being placed on an equality with the other states of the Union. Mormonism, in its part a conglomeration of illy cemented creeds, from other religions and in part founded upon the eccentric production of one Spalding, who having failed as a preacher and shopkeeper, undertook to write a historic novel. He had a smattering of biblical knowledge and chose for his subject the history of the lost tribes of Israel. The whole was supposed to be communicated by the Indians and the last of the series was named Mormon, representing 
that he had buried the book. It was a dull, tedious, interminable volume, marked by ignorance and folly. The work was so flat, stupid and insipid that no publisher could be induced to bring it before the world. Poor Spalding, at length, went to his grave and the manuscript remained a neglected roll in the possession of his widow. Then arose Joe Smith, more ready to live by his wits than by his lab- than by the labour of his hands. Smith had early in life manifested a turn for pious frauds. He had figured in several wrestling matches with the devil and had been conspicuous in giving in eventful experiences in religion at certain revivals. He announced that he had dug up the Book of Mormon which taught the true religion. This was none other than poor Spalding's manuscript which he had purloined from the widow. In his hands, the manuscript became the basis of Mormonism. Joe became a prophet, the founder of a religious sect, the president of a swindling bank, the builder of the city of Nauvoo, mayor of the city, general of the armies of Israel, candidate for president of the United States, and finally a martyr, as the saints choose to call him. But the truth is that his villainies, together with the villainies of his followers, brought down upon him the just vengeance of the people of Illinois and Missouri, and his career was brought to an end by his being shot while confined in jail in Carthage. It was unfortunate that such was his end, for his followers raised an old cry of martyrdom and persecution, and as always proved, the blood of the martyr was the seed of the church. Mormonism repudiates the celibacy imposed by the Catholic religion upon its priesthood, and takes in its stead the voluptuous impositions of the Mohammedan church, It preaches openly that the more wives and children its men have in this world, the pure, more influential and conspicuous will they be in the next. That wives, children and property will not only be restored, but doubled in the resurrection. It adopts the use of prayers and baptism for the dead as a part of its creed. Mormons claim to be favoured with marvellous gifts, the power of speaking in tongues, of casting out devils, of curing the sick, and of healing the lame and the halt. They claim that they have a living prophet, seer, and revelator who holds the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and through whose intercession alone access can be had. They recognise the Bible, but they interpret it for themselves, and hold that it is subject to be changed by new revelation, which they say supersedes old revelation. One of their doctrines is that of is that of continued progression to ultimate perfection. They say God was but a man, who went out developing and increasing until he reached his highest, his present high capacity. And they teach that Mormons will be equal to him. In a word, that good Mormons will become gods. They teach the shedding of blood for remission of sins, or, in other words, that if a Mormon apostatizes, his throat shall be cut and his blood poured out upon the ground for the remission of his sins. They also practice other revolting doctrines, such as are only carried out in polygamous countries, which is evidenced by a number of mutilated persons in their midst. 
they hold that the prophet's revelations are binding upon their consciences and that they are bound to obey him in all things. They say that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's, that they are God's chosen people on earth, that their mission on earth is to take charge of God's property and, as faithful stewards, that it is their duty to obtain it and are taught that in obtaining it they must not get in debt to the Lord's enemies for it. In other words, they teach that it is a duty to rob and steal from Gentiles. They have christened themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They claim that Mormonism is to go on spreading until it overthrows all the nations of the earth, and if necessary for its accomplishment, its success shall be consummated by the sword. That Jackson County, Missouri is to be the seat of empire of the Mormon church. That here the Mormons are to be finally gathered and that from that Zion shall proceed a power that will dethrone kings, subvert dynasties, and subjugate all the nations of the earth. I have said that their doctrines were repulsive to every refined mind. Every other false faith which has reigned its evil time upon this goodly world of ours has had some kindly and redeeming features. Even the semi-theocracy of the Aztecs, as Prescott tells you, disfigured as it was by horrid and bloody rites, was not without them. Buddhism and Brahmanism, with all their misshapen fables, still inculcated in no small degree, a pure code of morals. Nor is the like assertion untrue of Mohammedanism. It was reserved for Mormonism far off in the bosom of our beloved land to rear its head, its bead, naked in all its hideous deformity, and unblushingly, yes, defiantly proclaim a creed without the least redeeming feature, and of such character that the fuggism of India cannot match it. So at variance is the practice of polygamy with all the instincts of humanity that it has to be pressed upon the people with the greatest assiduity as a part of their religious duty. It is astonishing with what pertinacity pertinacity, through all their sermons and discourses it is justified and insisted on. Threats, entreaties, persuasions and commands are continually brought in play to enforce its cheerful observance. So revolting is it to the women that to aid in its enforcement... They are brutalised, their modesty destroyed by low, vile, vulgar expressions, such as I could not repeat, and would not ask the clerk to read in your hearing. If, however, my conjugal friend, the delegate from Utah, will undertake such task, I will most cheerfully furnish them for him. Certainly he ought not to hesitate, if they are proper to be repeated before large congregations of women and children in Salt Lake City, the representative of the church ought not to be ashamed at reading them to this house. Will the delegate from Utah read them? Condition of the Women But their teachings, officially reported by themselves, give you a better idea of their estimation of women, of woman, than anything I could say. I shall read to you from a few of their sermons on this subject, only observing that you may pick other passages inculcating similar doctrines containing 
Like threats, rebukes and complaints in nearly every sermon published in the church organ. President J. M. Grant in a sermon delivered september twenty first, eighteen fifty six, reported in the Deseret News, volume six, page two hundred and thirty five, said And we have women here who like anything but the celestial law of God, and if they could would break asunder the cable of the Church of Christ. There is scarcely a mother in Israel but would do it this day. And they talk it to their husbands, to their daughters, to their neighbours, and say that they have not seen a week's happiness since they became acquainted with that law, or since their husbands took a second wife. They want to break up the church of God, and to break it from their husbands and from their family connections. President Brigham Young, in a sermon delivered the same day, reported in the same paper, said, Now, for my proposition, it is more particularly for my sisters, as it is frequently happening that women say that they are unhappy. Men will say, My wife, though a most excellent woman, has not seen a happy day since I took my second wife. No, not a happy day for a year. It is said that women are tied down and abused, that they are misused, and have not the liberty they ought to have, that many of them are wading through a perfect flood of tears because of the conduct of some men, together with their own folly. I wish my women to understand that what I am going to say is for them, as well as all others, and I want those who are here to tell their sisters, yes, all the women of this community, and then write it back to the States, and do as you please with it. I am going to give you from this time to the sixth day of October, next for reflection, that you may determine whether you wish to stay with your husbands or not. And then I am going to set every woman at liberty and say to them now, go your way, my woman, with the rest. Go your way. And my wives have got to do one of two things, either round up their shoulders to endure the afflictions of this world and live their religion, or they may leave, for I will not have them about me. I will go into heaven alone, rather than have scratching and fighting around me. I will set all at liberty, What first wife too? Yes, I will liberate you all. I know what my women will say. They will say, you can have as many women as you please, Brigham, but I want to go somewhere and do something to get rid of the whiners. I do not want them to receive a part of the truth and spurn the rest out the doors. Let every man thus treat his wives, keeping raiment enough to clothe his body, And say to your wives, Take all that I have, and be set at liberty. But if you stay with me, you shall comply with the law of God, and that too without any murmuring and whining. You must fulfil the law of God in every respect, and round up your shoulders to walk up to the mark without any grunting. Now, recollect that two weeks from tomorrow, I am going to set you all at liberty. For the first wife will say, It is hard, for I have lived with my husband twenty years or thirty, and have raised a family of children for him. And it is a great trial for me, for him to have more women that will bear children. If my wife had borne me all the children that she ever would bear, the celestial law would teach me to take young women that would have children. Sisters, I am not joking. I do not throw out my proposition to banter your feelings to see whether you will leave your husbands all or any of you. 
but I do know that there is no cessation to the everlasting whinings of many of the women of this territory, and if the women will turn from the commandments of God and continue to despise the order of heaven, I will pray that the curse of the Almighty may be close to their heels, and that it may be following them all the day long, and those who enter into it and are faithful. I will promise them that they shall be queens in heaven and rulers for all eternity. President Heber C. Kimball, in a discourse delivered in the Tabernacle, November the 9th, 1856, said, and this is from Deseret News, Volume 6, page 291, I have no wife or child that any right to rebel against me. If they violate my laws and rebel against me, they will get into trouble just as quickly as though they transgress the counsels and teachings of Brother Brigham Young. Does it give a woman a right to sin against me because she is my wife? No. But it is her duty to do my will, as I do the will of my Father and my God. It is the duty of a woman to be obedient to her husband, and, le and unless she is, I will not give a damn for all her queenly right and authority, nor for her either if she will quarrel and lie about the work of God and the principles of plurality. A disregard of plain and correct teachings is the reason why so many are dead and damned and twice plucked up by the roots. And I would as soon baptise the devil as some of you. October the 6th. 1855, volume 5, page 274. Kimball said, If you oppose any of the works of God, you will cultivate a spirit of apostasy. If you oppose what is called the spiritual doctrines, the patriarchal order which is of God, that course will corrode you with apostasy, and you will go overboard. Still, a great many do so, and strive to justify themselves in it, but they are not justified in God. The principle of plurality of wives never will be done away, although some sisters have had revelations that when this time passes away and they go through the veil, every woman will have a husband to herself. I wish more of our young men would take to themselves wives of the daughters of Zion and not wait for us old men to take them all. Go ahead upon the right principle, young gentlemen, and God bless you forever and ever and make you fruitful that we may fill the mountains and then the earth with righteous inhabitants. April the 2nd 1854, President Heber C. Kimball said in the Tabernacle, see Deseret News, Volume 4, Number 20. There are some ladies who are not happy in their present situation, but that woman who cannot be happy with one man cannot be happy with two. You know, all women are good or ought to be. They are made for angelic beings, and I would like to see them act more angelic in their behaviour. You were made more angelic and a little weaker than man. Man is made of rougher material to open the way, cut down bushes and kill the snakes, that women may walk along through life and not soil and tear their skirts. When you see a woman with ragged skirts, you may know she wears the unmentionables, for she is doing the man's business and has not time to cut off the rags hanging about her. From this time henceforth you may know what woman wears her husband's pants. May the Lord bless you. Amen. President Heber C. Kimball, in a lengthened discourse, delivered in the tabernacle, 
on the fourth day of April, 1857, took occasion to say, I would not be afraid to promise a man who is sixty years of age if he will take the counsel of Brother Brigham and his brethren. He will renew his age. I have noticed that a man who has but one wife and is inclined to that doctrine soon begins to wither and dry up, while a man who goes into plurality looks fresh, young and sprightly. Why is this? Because, because God loves that man and because he honours his work and word. Some of you may not believe this, but I not only believe it, but I also know it. For a man of God to be confined to one woman is a small business, for it is as much as we can do to keep under the burdens we have to carry, and do not know what we should do if we only had one woman apiece. President Heber C. Kimball used the following language in a discourse instructing a band of missionaries about to start on their mission. I say to those who are elected to go on missions, go if you never return and commit what you have into the hands of God, your wives, your children, your brethren and your property. Let truth and righteousness be your motto. And don't go into the world for anything else but to preach the gospel, build up the kingdom of God, and gather the sheep into the fold. You are sent out as shepherds to gather the sheep together, and remember that they are not your sheep, they belong to him that sends you. Then don't make a choice of any of those sheep. Don't make selections before they are brought home and put into the fold. You understand that. Amen. Such then is Mormonism in regard to all that beautifies life in the conjugal relation. Such are their sentiments that commands pronounced under the assumed authority of God upon the female sex. When President Kimball calls his numerous wives his cows, he but reflects the Mormon idea of woman in the social scale. The view is sickening. I turn with loathing and disgust from their legalised status of systematic debauchery and lust. Before it the entire nature recoils. No wonder that it requires the whole engineering of the Mormon church frets and intimidations to compel the women to submit to it. I pity that man or woman who can for one moment look upon this organised, systematic and forced degradation and prostitution with any other feeling than that of abhorrence and disgust. In matters of affection... Woman is a monopolist. She wants the whole heart, or she wants none. But in Utah she is compelled to take part only of the smallest of hearts, a Mormon's heart. Little attention and no devotion. The church government established by the Mormons to carry into operation the teachings from which I have so copiously extracted is one of the most complete despotisms on the face of the earth. The mind of one man permeates through the whole mass of the people and subjects to its unrelenting tyranny the souls and bodies of all. It reigns supreme in church and state, in morals and even in the minutest domestic and social arrangements. Brigham's house is at once tabernacle, capital and harem. And Brigham himself is king, priest, lawgiver and chief polygamist. Is treason hatched in Utah? Brigham is the head traitor. Is a law enacted? Brigham's advice determines it. Is an offending Gentile or an apostate Mormon to be assassinated? The order emanates from Brigham. In addition to all this, he heals the afflicted by the laying on of hands and comforts the widow by becoming her husband. It may be asked, does he do this without compensation? No, his pay is both high and certain. He taxes his deluded followers to the extent 
of all surplus property upon the arrival in the territory. He subsequently taxes them to the extent of one-tenth of their annual production and labour, and if reluctant to pay, he mercilessly snatches all they have. He has, through the legislature, unrestricted licence to tax merchants. By legislation, all estrays in the territory are impounded and sold, and the proceeds paid over to him. By like authority, he seizes upon the great highway between our Atlantic and Pacific possessions, grants exclusive rights to erect bridges and ferries across all the streams in the territory and fixes the toll at enormous rates ranging from 5 to $10 for a team, expressly providing in the law that a portion of the receipts shall be paid over to himself. By which means, whether willing or unwilling, the emigrant to the Pacific coast is forced to build up the church and furnish money to emigrate pious sisters to Zion to replenish the harems of the hoary-headed leaders of the church. And if to consummate the matter of pay, all escheats in the territory are to him, the property of the emigrant and even the habiliments of the deceased may be sold and the proceeds paid over to him. He selects for himself the choicest spots of land in the territory and they yield him their productions, none daring to interfere. The timber in the mountains for a great distance from Salt Lake City belongs to him, and it is only by delivering each third load as he shall order that the gates are opened and the citizens allowed to pass up City Creek Canyon to obtain it. Having appropriated all that he desires for his own use, he has quite extensive tracts of country furnished him by the federal government as capital for his church. He sends his agents, denominating them missionaries, to Europe, who represent Utah as a paradise, and go into the market offering each proselyte who will come to Zion a homestead of a quarter of a section of land, being in return compensated by the addition of females to fill the harems, and the tithing which will in the future accrue to him. The cattle on a thousand hills exhibit his brand. He fixes his pay, pays himself. His pampered but plebeian body reposes in a palace, and scores of bright-eyed women call him husband. His deluded followers yield him implicit obedience, and a church organization known as Danites or Destroying Angels stands ready to protect his person or avenge his wrongs and to execute him pleasure. The legislators of the territory are Mormons. The endowment oaths bind them to yield an implicit obedience to Brigham as the head of the church and political head of the territory. His mandates are superior to all law. The Mormons are fanatics. They will keep their oath to obey him. Did not their religion induce their fears? Would compel obedience for the vengeance of Brigham, though silent, is swift and fearful as the horrors of death can make it. Mormon punishment for Mormon apostasy is like the old cure of former popes. It extends from the soles of the feet to the hairs of the head. It separates the husband from the wife. It reaches from the confiscation of property to the severance of the windpipe. Armed with such power over the hearts and lives of the people, Brigham defiantly drives the barbaric chariot of Mormon robbery, murder, polygamy and incest over all law, in defiance of all federal officials in the territory, 
Brigham not only controls the legislation, but he controls the courts. He uses the one to aid in accomplishing the other. As one of the associate justices of the Territory of Utah in the month of April 1859, I commenced and held a term of the District Court of the Second Judicial District in the city of Provo, about 60 miles south of Salt Lake City. General A.S. Johnston, in command of the military department, furnished a small military force for the purpose of protecting the court. A grand jury was impanelled and their attention was pointed and specifically called to the great number of crimes that had been committed in the immediate vicinity. Cases of public notoriety both as to the offence and the persons who had perpetrated the same. For none of these things had been done in a corner. Their perpetrators had scorned alike concealment or apology, both the arrival of the American forces. The jury, thus instructed, though kept in session two weeks, utterly refused to do anything, and were finally discharged as an evidently useless appendage to a court of justice. But the court was determined to try a last resource, to bring to light and to punish those guilty of the atrocious crimes which had been committed in the territory. And the session continued. Bench warrants, based upon sworn information, were issued against the alleged criminals and United States Marshal Dotson, a most excellent and reliable officer aided by a military posse, procured on his own request, had succeeded in making a few arrests. A general stampede immediately took place among the Mormons, and what I wish to call your attention to as particularly noticeable is the fact that this occurred more especially among the church officials and civil officers. Why were these classes so peculiarly urgent and hasty in flight. The law of evidence, based on the experience of ages, has but one answer. It was the consciousness of guilt which drove them to seek a refuge from the avenging arm of the law, armed at last, as they supposed, with power to vindicate its injured majesty. It is a well-known fact that many of the bishops and presidents of stakes remain secreted in the mountains until the news was confirmed beyond doubt which announced the retrograde course of the administration at Washington. Sitting as a committing magistrate, complaint after complaint was made before me of murders and robberies. Among these... I may mention as peculiarly and shockingly prominent the murder of Forbes, the assassination of the parishes and potter of Jones and his mother, of the Aiken party, of which there were six in all, the worst and darkest in this appalling catalogue of blood, the cowardly, cold-blooded butchery and robbery at the Mountain Meadows. At that time... There still lay, all ghastly upon the sun of Utah, the unburied skeletons of 119 men, women and children, the hapless, hopeless victims of the Mormon creed. Judge Cradlebore then gives a full history of his visit to the scene of the massacre and of his utter failure to procure the arrest of one of the guilty parties and also gives the reasons why the courts were powerless to bring offenders to justice. After giving the history of many of the crimes committed by the priestly crew, the speech closes with the following eloquent sentences. There can be no doubt that the mass of the Mormon community are misled in their errors by a set of heartless, fanatical leaders. 
Their success may be much attributed to their isolation. That isolation, the fast filling up of the Great Basin because of its vast mineral deposits, will soon do away with. Nevada now has a population equal to Utah. Thriving towns and cities are springing up on the Humboldt River and in near proximity to the Mormons. Brigham sees this, and he knows and feels that he must place himself in a position to prevent the consequences of his system which will grow out of this contiguity of settlement. He feels that he cannot keep his women where they have a chance to get away unless he can protect himself by legislation further than he is able to do while his community remains under the general jurisdiction of the government. It is on that account that he manifests so great a desire to become an independent state. I say he desires to become a state for... Under his tyrannical sway, and with the system that is now prevalent, Brigham would be the state, and the state would be Brigham. The people of Utah have nothing but ill will towards our government. The great mass know nothing of our institutions. They came to Zion, not to America. They are hurried through the settled portions of our country, without being allowed to become acquainted with our people or institutions. Upon arriving in Utah, they hear nothing but abuse of our people. The whole fountain of patriotism is polluted, and they are taught that they owe neither allegiance nor love to our government. Treason and insubordination are openly taught. God forbid that this people should be admitted into the union of an independent state. I protest against it in the name of humanity, which it would violate by the admission. I protest against it on behalf of my constituents, who have a deep interest in the institutions that are are to prevail in the great American basin. I protest against it in the name and on behalf of the murdered victims of the cruel Mormon faith, whose smouldering bones are bleaching in almost every valley In the territory, I protest against it on behalf of the downtrodden and undone women of Utah, who, with their female posterity, in all time to come, will bless those that would not aid in keeping them in bondage. (coughs) The foregoing is, in my judgment, sufficient to show that Mormonism was and the influences that were brought to bear upon the citizens of Utah at the time of the commission of the massacre. The territory was practically without courts of justice from 1857 until after the passage of the Poland Bill, since which time the federal officers in Utah have made great and praiseworthy exertions to enforce the laws in the territory. Organisation of the court at Beaver City. The second district court convened in Beaver City, Utah Territory on the 7th day of September AD 1874. A grand jury was summoned by the 7th of September but the panel was not completed until the 9th of September. This was the first grand jury under the Poland Bill This was the first term of this court at which a federal or Gentile officer had charge of the grand jury. This grand jury consisted of 15 men, 10 Gentiles, 4 Mormons and 1 apostate. William Stokes and B.L. Duncan rendered efficient service in procuring witnesses to go before this grand jury. This grand jury was in session from the 9th to the 25th day of September. The indictment against John D. Lee and others charged them with the crime of murder at the Mountain Meadows was returned into court on the 24th day of September 1874. 
28 indictments for various crimes were found and returned by this jury. D.P. Wedden, Esquire, acted as Deputy United States Attorney and drew all the indictments present at that term of court. Great credit is due to Judge Wedden for the able manner in which he discharged his duty while acting as Deputy United States Attorney in Utah. Honourable Jacob S. Borman was the presiding judge during all of the time since 1874 in that district. General George B. Maxwell, the United States Marshal for Utah, was an efficient officer. He resigned his position after the first trial of Lee and was succeeded by Colonel William Nelson, the present United States Marshal for Utah. James B. Wilkins, the clerk of the court, is an affable, educated gentleman, in every way qualified for his position. Honourable William Carey, United States Attorney, who prosecuted at the first trial, was succeeded by Honourable Sumner Howard, who secured a conviction of Lee by beating the Mormons at their own game of trickery. At the first trial, a jury was sworn to try the case on the 24th day of July, 1875. The prosecution was conducted by William Carey, United States Attorney for Utah, D.P. Wedden, Deputy United States Attorney, R.N. Boskin, Presley Denny, Charles H. Swift and C.M. Hawley. The defendant was represented by J.G. Sutherland, E.D. Hogue, Wells Spicer, John McFarland and William W. Bishop. After several days of legal strife, the case was given to the jury and failing to agree, nine being for not guilty and three being for guilty, the jury were discharged and the case continued. At the succeeding May term of the court, the prosecution, being without money to carry on the case or procure witnesses, and the defendant insisting upon a trial, the court admitted him to bail in the sum of $10,000, which bail was at once given, and Lee was then discharged from custody and remained at liberty until a few days before the commencement of the second trial, at which time he was surrendered to the court by his Mormon bondsman. They, having been ordered by the church authorities to withdraw all assistance and sympathy from John D. Lee, as he had been selected as a victim to shoulder the sins of the people of the Mormon church. Daniel H. Wells was present in person at Beaver to see that the treachery of the Mormon leaders was completely carried out. September the 14th, 1876, a jury was empanelled to try the case the second time. Twelve jurymen were found who were considered safe by the church authorities and all other parties concerned and the trial commenced. The attorneys for the defendant had been furnished a list of the jurymen, and the list was examined by a committee of Mormons who marked those who would convict with a dash, those who would rather not convict with a star, and those who were certain to acquit John D. Lee under all circumstances with two stars. It is sufficient on that subject to simply say all the jurymen accepted were marked with the two stars in the list, and they acted as the church directed. They convicted. As a matter of explanation, I may be pardoned for saying that the Mormons, who gave us the list so marked, had shown it to Howard before they gave it to us, and informed him that he had nothing to fear. The law and evidence, and also Brigham Young and the Mormon Church, were 
all against Lee, hence his conviction was a foregone conclusion. The evidence is given in full in the body of his work and speaks for itself. The jury brought in a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree and the court passed a sentence of death upon Lee. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court of Utah Territory and the judgment of the district court affirmed Lee was again taken to Beaver and sentenced to be shot. The sentence was carried into effect on the 23rd day of March, A.D. 1877. At the last trial, the prosecution was conducted by Sumner Howard, U.S. Attorney for Utah, and Presley Denny, Deputy U.S. Attorney. The defendant was represented by Wells Spicer, J.C. Foster, and W.W. Bishop. After John D. Lee had been convicted, he consented to make a full confession of all that he knew concerning the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and at his request I assisted him in writing up the confession. He then made an assignment of all his writings to me and requested me to publish the same. I have over 1,000 pages of his manuscripts and writing in his own handwriting. I have corrected the same as I have seen fit by correcting the spelling and punctuation. Otherwise, I give the writings and confession in the exact language of John D. Lee. Several persons having made claim to the possession of the true confession of Lee I can only say that what I have published was given to me by him for the purpose of publication and that he insisted up to the moment of his execution his statements were true. As my authority for publishing his life and confessions I give the following letter which he wrote to me and which with others that I have since received from him and still retain give me the sole right to publish his writings. The letter reads as follows. Beaver City, Utah Territory, September 8. 1876 W.W. Bishop Dear Sir, having acted for me as one of my attorneys and having in all respects done your utmost for my acquittal and interest generally now that I am awaiting sentence of death on the charge of having aided in the Mountain Meadows Massacre in case of my death or final imprisonment I wish you to still continue my counsel and friend, and as such to publish to the world the history of my life and of my connection with the affair for which I have been tried. You are familiar with the facts and have my statements which are true. My journals and private papers will be furnished you by my family, the same to be returned when examined. In justice to myself and to my family, I wish you to publish the true history of my life. After the expenses are paid for the publication, I expect you to divide the profits arising therefrom with my family, charging you with the sacred trust and by reason of my own inability to publish my life by reason of imprisonment, I urge you to carry out this my request. Your true friend, and no mistake, John D. Lee. The Mountain Meadows Massacre are situated in Washington County, Utah Territory, and between the 7th and 8th parallels of South Latitude from Salt Lake Meridian. If the government survey was extended over that portion of Utah Territory, then the particular portion of the meadows where the massacre was committed would be within the limits of Township 30, 
7. South of range 12 west, the monument erected in the place of the massacre is 320 miles southwest from Salt Lake City by road measure as the road ran in 1857. A line extended 200 miles due south from Salt Lake City and then run at right angles 75 miles due west would terminate at the monument. The Meadows are 36 miles southwest of Cedar City, where the massacre was finally planned by Haight, Higby, Klingon Smith, and the Mormon authorities, then in council. At the time of the massacre, if the evidence of the vampires who acted as church slaves to secure the conviction of Lee are to be believed, the meadows were covered with an abundance of rank, nutritious grasses and was a beautiful smiling spot of earth inviting the beholder to rest and repose. Now it is an arid waste with but little vegetation upon its plains. The springs once furnishing a bounteous supply of water are now comparatively dry and wasted away. The meadows are such only in name. All that gave them beauty has long since faded and gone. They lie there as one of the cursed spots of earth, surrounded by desolation so intense that a fanatic seeking death in order to escape from the troubles of this sin-cursed earth, seeking death, in order to obtain the celestial reward offered by some self-styled apostle, anxious to give up life at once and try the realities of the hereafter, would forego his promised joys and dwell in this land of sorrow for a season rather than lay down the, the body that he was so anxious to separate from and leave it to smoulder upon the unsightly spot where so much or wrong has been done in the name of religion. Mormon tradition informs us that the ghosts of the slaughtered emigrants meet nightly at the springs, and with phantom-like stillness, but with perfectness of detail, act over in pantomime the cruelties and horrors connected with the massacre. I acknowledge myself greatly indebted to D.P. Wedden, Esquire, Honourable William Nelson, William Stokes, Esquire, John Ward Christian, Esquire, General George R. Maxwell, Honourable Sumner Howard, A.S. Patterson, Esquire, and the Salt Lake Tribune Publishing Company, for many favours extended to me by them, in furnishing me with valuable documents or use in the work of compiling this manuscript for publication. I also acknowledge myself under much under many obligations to Colonel G. O. M. Sabin of Pioche, Nevada, for his valuable services rendered me in the preparation of this work for the press. I have now kept faith with my unfortunate client and I feel I have also performed a duty that I owed to myself and the country. William W. Bishop, Pioche, Nevada, May the 17th, 1877 End of the Introduction Mormonism Unveiled by John D. Lee, 1877 Read by Paul Martin 2019. Copyright Paul Martin's Fine Films and Audio Books. Chapter 1. A Stormy Beginning. In justice to myself, my numerous family, and the public in general, I consider it my duty to write a history of my life. I shall content myself with giving facts and let the readers draw their own conclusion therefrom. By the world at large, I am called a vile criminal, 
and have been sentenced to be shot for deeds committed by myself and others nearly 20 years ago. I never willingly committed a crime. I have acted my religion, nothing more. I have obeyed the orders of the church. I have acted as I was commanded to do by my superiors. And if I have committed acts that justify my execution, I ask my readers to say what should be the fate of the leaders in the church who taught me to believe that I could not and would not commit sin while obeying orders of the priesthood. My sins, if any, are the result of doing what I was commanded to do by those who were my superiors in authority in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I will now give the facts which relate to my own history and leave it to others to say how I should have acted, how they would have acted if situated as I was. I was born on the 6th day of September, A.D. 1812, in the town of Kaskaskia, Randolph County, Illinois. My father, Ralph Lee, was born in the state of Virginia. He was of the family of Lees of revolutionary fame and was a relative of General Robert E. Lee of the late war. He served his time as an apprentice and learned the carpenter's trade of the city of Baltimore. My mother was born in Nashville, Tennessee. She was the daughter of John Doyle, who for many years held the position of Indian agent over the roving tribes of Indians in southeastern Illinois. He served in the War of the Revolution and was wounded in one of the many battles in which he took part with the Sons of Liberty against the English oppressors. About the year 1796, he was appointed Indian agent and moved to Kaskaskia, Illinois. My mother was first married in 1799 to Oliver Reed and lived with him until he was assassinated by a man named Jones who entered the house when the family were asleep and striking Reed with a seat of a loom knocked his brains out at the same time severely wounding my half-sister Eliza Virginia, then six months old. The blow and the screams of the child wakened my mother who sprang from the bed and recognising the assassin said, For God's sake, Jones, spare my husband's life. Jones said, You know me, God damn you. You shall tell no tales. With this he caught up a sugar trough and struck my mother on the head with it. The blow rendered her senseless. Jones, believing he had completed his work of death, then left the house. My mother, soon revived, called upon the neighbours for assistance and told who had committed the murder. Jones was arrested, convicted and afterwards hung for the crime. The injuries received by my mother from the blow struck by Jones affected her all the rest of her life. After the death of Reed, my mother went back to Kaskaskia, lived in her father's family until she married my father in the year 1808. My mother had two children by my father, that is William Oliver and myself. My brother, William Oliver, died when about two years old. 
At the time of my birth, my father was considered one of the leading men of that section of country. He was a master workman, sober and attentive to business, prompt and punctual to his engagements. He contracted largely and carried on a heavy business. He erected a magnificent mansion for that age and country on his land adjoining the town of Kaskaskia. This tract of land was the property of my mother when she married my father. My grandfather, Doyle, was a wealthy man. He died in 1809 at Kaskaskia, Illinois, and left his whole fortune to my mother and her sister, Charlotte, by will. They being his only children, he divided the property equally between them. My father and mother were both Catholics, were raised in that faith. I was christened in that church. William Morrison and Louise Phillips stood as my representative godfather and godmother. It is from that church record that I could alone obtain the facts and date that referred to my birth. When about one year old, my mother being sick, I was sent to a French nurse, a Negro woman. At this time, my sister Eliza was 11 years old, but young as she was, she had to care for my mother and do all the work of the household. To add to the misfortune, my father began to drink heavily, and soon, very dissipated, drinking and gambling was his daily occupation. The interest and care of his family was no longer a duty with him. His presence was seldom seen to cheer and comfort his lonely, afflicted wife. The house was one mile from town, and we had no neighbours nearer than that. The neglect and indifference on the part of my father towards my afflicted mother served to increase her anguish and sorrow until death came to her relief. My mother's death left us miserable indeed. We were, my sister and I, thrown upon the wide world, helpless, and I might say without father or mother. My father, when free from the effects of intoxicating drink, was a kind-hearted, generous, noble man. But from that time forward, he was a slave to drink, seldom sober. My Aunt Charlotte was a regular spitfire. She was married to a man by the name of James Connor, a Kentuckian by birth. They lived ten miles north of us. My sister went to live with her aunt, but the treatment she received was so brutal that the citizens complained to the county commissioners and she was taken away from her aunt and bound out to Dr Fisher with whose family she lived until she became of age. In the meantime, the doctor moved to the city of Vandalia, Illinois. I remained with my nurse until I was eight years old, when I was taken to my Aunt Charlotte's to be educated. I had been in a family which talked French so long that I'd nearly lost the knowledge of my mother tongue. The children at school called me Gumbo and teased me so much that I became disgusted with the French language and tried to forget it, which has been a disadvantage to me since that time. My aunt was rich in her own right, My uncle Connor was poor. He drank and gambled and wasted her fortune. She, in return, gave him thunder and blitzen all the time. 
The more she scolded, the worse he acted, until they would fight like cats and dogs. Between them, I was treated worse than an African slave. I lived in the family eight years and can safely say I got a whipping every day I was there. My life was one of misery and wretchedness. And if it had not been for my strong religious convictions, I certainly would have committed suicide to have escaped from the miserable condition I was in. I then believed, as I do still, that for the crime of suicide, there was no forgiveness in this world or that which is to come. My aunt was more like a savage than a civilised woman. In her anger, she generally took her revenge upon those around her who were the least to blame. She would strike with anything she could obtain with which to work an injury. I have been knocked down and beaten by her until I was senseless scores of times and I yet carry many scars on my person the result of my harsh usage by her. My experience in childhood made a lasting impression upon me. The horrors of a contentious family have haunted me through life. I then resolved in my mind that I would never subject myself to sorrow and misery as my uncle had done. I would marry for love and not for riches. I also formed the resolution that I would never gamble after I was married and I've kept that resolution since I was a married man. Aunt Charlotte had five children four girls and one boy, Minerva C., Amanda, Eliza, Maria and John Edgar. They, as well as myself, were strangers to the affections of a mother and the pleasures of a home. When I was 16 years old, I concluded to leave my aunt's house. I cannot call it home, My friends advised me to do so. I walked one night to Kaskaskia, went to Robert Morrison and told him my story. He was a mail contractor. He clothed me comfortably and sent me over the Mississippi River into Missouri to carry the mail from St. Genevieve to Pinckney on the north side of the Missouri River via Potosi, a distance of 127 miles. It was a weekly mail. I was to receive $7 a month for my services. This was in December 1828. It was a severe winter, snow unusually deep, and roads bad. I was often until two o'clock at night in reaching my stations. In the following spring, I came near losing my life on several occasions when swimming the streams, which were then generally over their banks. The Merrimack was the worst stream I had to cross, but I escaped danger and gave satisfaction to my employer. At my request, I was changed in the spring of 1829 to the route from Kaskaskia to Vandalia, Illinois, the then capital of the state. The route went by Covington and Carlisle. This was also a weekly route. The distance was about 100 miles and I had 18 hours in which to make the trip. While I was carrying the mail in Missouri, I got a letter from my sister informing me of her marriage to Josiah Nichols, 
a nephew of Barker Berry, the sheriff of Fayette County, Illinois, and inviting me to visit them. Nichols was a wealthy man and lived 16 miles north of Vandalia. I had not met my sister for many years, so I concluded to visit her. This was one reason why I wished to put on the Vandalia route. One day, when I arrived at Vandalia, I did not find postmaster in the post office. I could not find him, so I left mail at the post office door and rode up to my brother-in-law's house. I had a pleasant visit there and returned the next morning to carry the mail back to Kaskaskia. The postmaster, not knowing where I was, had sent another person with the mail at my expense. It cost me $15, a little over my wages, for two months. I returned to Kaskaskia, where my employer received me kindly and laughed at my mishap. I agreed to pay all damages if he would change me to another route, for I could not consent to return again to the scene of my failure. My employer kindly gave me the place as stage driver from Kaskaskia to Shawneetown on the Ohio River. The route ran by Pinckneyville and Gallatin, and it was 120 miles in length through thinly settled country. I drove on that line about one month when I commenced driving stage from Kaskaskia to Belleville. In travelling this route, I passed by my Aunt Charlotte Connor's place. Uncle Connor had then gone to the lead mines at Galena. When my aunt and cousins saw me, they all begged me to return and live with them. They made great promises of kindness, and I was finally persuaded to agree to return and live in the family. I soon quit the stage driving business and returned to my aunt's. All I know of my father after I was eight years of age is that he went to Texas in the year 1820 and I have never heard of him since. What his fate was, I never knew. When my mother died, my uncle and Aunt Connor took all the property, a large tract of land, several slaves, household and kitchen furniture, and all, and as I had no guardian, I never received any portion of the property. In fact, I was robbed of all. The slaves were set free by an act of the legislature. The land was sold for taxes and was hardly worth redeeming when I came of age. So I sold my interest in all the land that had belonged to my mother and made a quit claim deed to it to Sidney Breeze, a lawyer of Kaskaskia, in consideration of $200. My sister, by the kindness of Dr Fisher, her guardian, received a much greater price for her interest in the land than I did. I was born on the point of land between and above the south of the Ochor or Kaskaskia River and the Mississippi River in what is known as the Great American Bottom. The particular point I refer to was then called Zeal No War, the Island of Nuts. It was 19 miles from the point of the bluffs to the mouth of the Ochor River, 10 miles wide, up at the bluffs and tapering to a point where the rivers united. Large bands of wild horses, French ponies called punt horses, were to be found any day feeding on the evergreen and nutritious grasses and vegetation. 
Cattle and hogs were also running wild in great numbers. Every kind of game, large and small, could be had with little exertion. The streams were full of fish. The forests contained many varieties of timber, nuts, berries and wild fruits of every description found in the temperate zone could be had in their season. The point of land is one of the finest on the globe. There I spent my early year. There I had pleasures and sorrows. There I met the maiden that first taught me love's young dream. Nearby was the Kaskaskia Reservation of the Kaskaskia Indians. Louis de Quan was chief of the tribe. He had a frame house painted in bright colours, but he never would farm any. Game being so plentiful, he had no need to labour. Nearly all the settlers were French and not very anxious for education or improvement of any kind. I was quite a lad before I ever saw a wagon carriage, set of harness or a ring, a staple or set of bows to an ox yoke. The first wagon I ever saw was brought into my brought into that county by a Yankee peddler. His outfit created as great an excitement in the settlement as the first locomotive did in Utah. The people flocked in from every quarter to see the Yankee wagon. Everything in use in that country was of the most simple and primitive construction. There were no sawmills or grist mills in that region. Sword lumber was not in the country. The wagons were two-wheeled carts made entirely of wood, not a particle of iron about them. The hubs were of white elms, spokes of white oak or hickory, the fellows of black walnut. As it was soft and would hear rounding, the fellows were made six inches thick and were strongly doweled together with seasoned hardwood pins. The linchpin was of hickey or nab. The thus were wood. In fact, all of it was wood. The harness consisted of a corn husk collar, hames cut from an ash tree root or from an oak. Tugs were rawhide. The lines were also rawhide. A hackney or halter was used in the place of a bridle. One horse was lashed between the hills by rawhide straps and pins in the thills for a hold back. When two horses were used, the second horse was fastened ahead of the first by straps fastened on to the fills of the cart. Oxen were yoked as follows. A square stick of timber of sufficient length was taken and hollowed out at the ends to fit on the neck of the ox. Close up to the horns, this was fastened by rawhide straps to the horns. All other implements were made in an equally primitive manner. The people were of necessity self-sustaining, for they were forced to depend upon their own resources for everything they used. Clothing was made of home-manufactured cloth or the skins of wild animals. Imported articles were procured at heavy cost, and but few found their way to our settlements. Steamboats and railroads were then unthought of, by us at least, and the navigation of the Mississippi was carried on in small boats that could be drawn up along the river bank by means of oars, spikes, poles and hook. The articles most in demand in the settlements were axes, hoe, cotton cards, hatchelor, 
for cleaning flax, hemp and cotton, spinning wheels, knives and ammunition, guns and bar shears for ploughs. In exchange for such goods, the people traded beef, hides, furs, tallow, beeswax, honey, etc. Money was not needed or used by anyone. Everything was trade and barter. The people were generous and brave. Their pleasures and pastimes were those usual in frontier settlements. They were hearty and well versed in woodcraft. They aided each other and were all in all a noble class of people possessing many virtues and few faults. The girls were educated by their mothers to work and had to work. It was then a disgrace for a young woman not to know how to take the raw material, the flax and cotton, and, unaided, manufacture her own clothing. It is a lamentable fact that such is no longer the case. End of chapter 1